Learning to save money is something that can benefit anyone. Yet, overall, we're doing less and less of it. Did you know a survey from 2021 says almost 25% of Americans have no emergency savings at all? Saving money does sound like a pipe dream, but the good news is it's not impossible. With the right tactics, we can trick ourselves to save money. Hello everyone and welcome to Investor Info. In this video, we'll be sharing six psychological tricks to help you save more money. Number six, don't trust yourself. Do you ever feel like there's a leak in your bank account? It's like the sound of water dripping, a tiny crack through which a slow stream of money is draining away. You know, it's there because the cash isn't, but you can't find the source. You scrounge through your bank account, looking at all of your expenses, but they seem normal. The embarrassing truth is that every day, in countless idiotic ways, we, unfortunately, just waste money. We're all for trusting ourselves in most areas of life, but it can backfire when it comes to money. Why? Because we're human, and we want what we want. And often, that means spending, not saving. We suggest taking the control out of your hands. That means you should try automating your finances. Here is a simple strategy you can try. Set up automatic withdrawals from your paycheck into your savings or retirement accounts, or better, both. One way to do this is to push 10% of your paycheck into a separate, hands-off account with a fintech company, which doesn't charge overdraft fees, monthly maintenance fees, foreign transaction fees, or minimum balance fees. You won't miss something you've never held, right? <laughs> that amount will definitely accumulate over time, and it might just help you on a rainy day. Number five, pay in cash. Just a decade or two ago, most people used cash for most things. But today, a vast majority of Americans make purchases with digital wallets, credit, or debit cards. The benefit of using e-wallets and credit cards are obvious. Points and rewards, of course. Not to mention, you don't need to carry big sweaty wads of money. Then, when it comes to cash in hand, there is a liability. If cash gets stolen, it's gone. There is no recourse. But if a credit card gets stolen, a call to the bank will fix the problem. The shopper has minimal liability and often no liability at all. But do you ever think about the downside of using digital wallets and credit cards instead of cash? And more broadly, does it matter how you pay for your purchases? From recent consumer psychology research, it is revealed that paying with a credit card is less painful than paying with cash. So, shoppers tend to spend more money when paying in other forms other than actual cash in their wallets. Because of these two reasons, people overspend when using credit cards. In one study, the authors found that participants were willing to spend $175 to throw a Thanksgiving party when using a credit card to buy the food, but only $145 when using cash. That's almost a 20% difference. The research finds that paying in cold, hard, physical cash will cause two things to happen. One, it will be more physically hesitant to hand over money. Two, it's psychologically easier to spend smaller bills than it is to spend larger bills because our brains see them as a scarce and valuable resource. We are hardwired to want to hoard these resources for future use. Did you know watching someone burn a $20 bill will light up the brain more than watching someone burn a $1 bill? You can guess what it does when they watch someone burn $100, right? The point here is, paying in cash also gives you a clear idea of how much you have left. Unlike e-wallets and credit cards, the currency is physical and limited, instead of imaginary and seemingly unlimited. So, using cash instead of a credit card is simple but it is proven to work. Number four, ask what an item truly is worth. A lot of times we buy things not because we need them, but because we want them, based on the idea of owning that item, the emotion of joy and happiness that it can potentially provide us. For example, you may buy a car that is more expensive than it needed to be, just because you'll look super cool in it. After three years, it'll stop being cool, but the bank will keep wanting payments. 
Needless to say, by then you'll learn how much people don't care about what car you drive. We often fall prey to something called the anchoring bias, the effect that occurs when the value of something is based on your initial reaction to it. For a quick example, if you buy a TV for $800, which is valued at $1,000, you'd feel great. However, if you saw the same TV a week ago listed for $600, but now they raise the price to $800, you would not feel so great about paying the $800. You should determine the true value of the item you're buying. Ask what practical use an item has to you, and then compare this to the price you plan on paying for it. Taking time to weigh the pros and cons of the purchase can help you save money. Also, you can ask yourself these questions. The very first question you should always ask yourself before making a big purchase is, can I afford it? If the answer is no, start by saving up for it by using any leftover money from your budget. If the answer is yes, then great. But you still have to make sure that the money is coming out of your budget and you're using the money that you already have in your bank account. The next question to ask yourself is whether do you need it or is it just a want? When it comes to needing versus wanting, we all tend to get a little confused sometimes, especially when it comes to something we have our eyes set on. To distinguish wants from needs, ask yourself if you have an item that serves the same purpose. If you do, you probably don't need it, and you may want to reconsider the purchase. If you just can't get the item out of your mind, consider selling the other item you already have and using that money to pay for the new one. Then, another question is what can I cut from the budget to make room for this? If you can't afford something but you know you want or need it, this is a question you'll want to ask yourself. Is there something extra in the budget now that you are willing to cut to save for the big purchase? Consider sacrificing a few luxuries like eating out, Netflix, gym memberships, or magazine subscriptions for your three month waiting period. You can save a ton doing this. Another one is, will this add value to my life? Once you determine if and how you can afford an item, now you need to evaluate the value it will bring to your life. Will this item enhance the quality of your life in any way? Will I use this item? How often will I use this item? Does the amount of use justify the purchase price? These are important questions. No matter how good a deal is, buying something you will rarely use is still a waste of money. Then another question is, how long will this item last? While we all love a good cheap deal, make sure you always do your research to ensure it's a quality item before you buy. You'll save big in the long run if you spend a little more money on quality up front. Just because something is cheaper doesn't mean it's a better deal. You'll end up spending double if it breaks and you have to buy another one. Then the last question to ask yourself is, can I borrow it? If the item is something you won't use much and something that you don't particularly care to own, it might be worth it to borrow it. If you can borrow something, it doesn't make sense to buy it, especially if you can borrow it for free or at a low cost. If you aren't sure whether or not you will like a book, check it out of the library first or just borrow power tools that you don't use much. Take the time to reconsider before you buy something. You just might find that you don't need to buy it at all. Not only are these questions crucial to ask before a big personal purchase, but they are also a great way to determine whether or not you should buy something for someone else. A simple rule of thumb is to ask yourself these questions when you plan on purchasing something. Give it three days of thought and then ask these questions again. Most of the time, you'll probably see that it was the hype of the moment that made you excited. This is a great way to avoid impulse purchases and will save you more money and, more importantly, save yourself from all the buyer's regret. Number 3. Make a saving habit Cutting back, spending less, being frugal, yeah, doesn't sound like a heck of a lot of fun, does it? We often associate saving money with feelings of deprivation, with having to pass up things that we love and that doesn't give us much impetus to follow through. So try to make the bland process as enjoyable and automated as possible, and you'll be motivated to stash more cash. Begin by creating a monthly routine for evaluating your savings that you might look forward to. To put this concept into practice, 
Think through how much you can afford to save each month. Separate your wants and needs and see where your cash flow goes. This might sound very cliche, but a good way to do this is by tracking your expenses. Now, before you roll your eyes, listen. We don't need to carry a journal to jot and list every time we spend on a small notebook. Hey, we're living in 2022, people. We have apps for these things. Since we're almost always on our phone anyways, might as well make full use of a spending tracker that helps you keep track of your finances. A simple, good app is Money Lover. It's simple, you download the app and start by inputting your current finances and from there on, make sure to input all your transactions, both expenses and income. This way, when you review your finances at the end of the month, you'll get to see exactly where your priorities are and where your money goes. You will be very surprised just how much we spend on food. Subconsciously, this way of seeing where our money goes, it creates sort of a habit to be more vigilant in our spending and focusing on things that really matter. Keep in mind that it's also never too early to begin to build a savings habit. A study published in Psychological Science found that developing regular money-saving habits helped people bank more of their disposable income. According to the research, any effort to routinize the process could potentially increase the amount of savings. Saving money doesn't have to be painful. You probably should allow yourself a little wiggle room to enjoy yourself, within reason. If you're too hard on yourself, you may develop an all-or-nothing mentality that ultimately undermines your savings goals. As for creating saving as a habit, let's talk about a budgeting method that may help you reach that 20% savings target. This rule is called the 50-30-20 rule. If you're looking for an accessible, easy-to-remember budgeting tool, look no further than this rule. Created by U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren when she was a law professor specializing in bankruptcy law, the 50-30-20 rule suggests breaking down your monthly expenditures according to the following rules. 50% of your gross income should go towards your needs. Example, rent, utilities, and debt repayments. 30% should go towards your wants. Examples, eating out, gym subscriptions, holidays. 20% should go towards your savings goals. If you follow the 50-30-20 rule, you should be saving 20% of your income each month. This is a nice round number, but think of it more of a guideline than a rigid rule. Next, reward yourself each time you hit a milestone. People tend to focus on how far away they are from their goal, but it's also important to give yourself credit for what you've accomplished. Celebrate your successes, reaching the $10,000 mark in your IRA, getting to the halfway point in your mortgage assets by indulging in a treat. Not a shopping spree at expensive stores, but a simple reward for yourself that can reinforce you to continue to build this habit. That cognitive reinforcement makes you more likely to stick with your saving objectives and continue making better choices. Number two, improve your financial literacy. It might bore and uninterest you in so many ways at first, but being a responsible adult means being able to manage your finances. Money is a part of life and we simply can't turn a blind eye when dealing with it. The more we learn about proper investments, good money habits, bad money habits, financial scams, or even finance terms, the more aware we are of how easy it is to manage or mismanage money. In this case, you can do so by reading many useful finance-related books like Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki and Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you're not really into reading, why not subscribe to our personal finance-related YouTube channels like Yours Truly, Investor Info. Others also include Graham, Stephen, and the Rich Dad channel. With time and the internet on your side, you'll learn so many things about life, finance, and money that you never even thought about. And in the end, you'll see just how good money habits that are supposedly common might not be so common after all. Number one, manifestation. Imagine your future richer self. Make positive manifestation a daily habit. The key to saving money for the future might not be self-discipline, but rather the ability to imagine that tomorrow indeed is coming. Having a good imagination can be linked to healthy eating habits and even resistance to drug use, say researchers at the University of Pennsylvania. In another study, a specialist in the field of neuroeconomics 
found that subjects whose brains show added activity when imagining the future also make better decisions about money. It is suspected that consumers who can really viscerally imagine how great that new car will smell when they drive off the lot, or how excited they will be when getting the keys to a new home, have a much easier time saving money. Conversely, those who have dull imaginations tend to live in the present and blow their cash on payday. It can be difficult to consistently save money for a goal that seems very far away. There are many pressing financial needs, and retirement may be decades in the future. In short, when it comes to saving money, think long term. Even if you're just in your mid 20s, there are many compelling reasons to begin saving money for retirement now. We should practice delayed gratification for this cause. Delayed gratification means putting off what we want now to get something bigger and better later on. It is definitely one of the major keys to financial success. Think about this both our grandparents' generation and ours save, invest, and spend. What then is the difference between them and us? It's mainly that they used to first earn money, save, and invest that money, and then spend it on things they needed. They got delayed gratification, with this quality of waiting before they can buy. However, today, with credit and loans, we have reversed the equation. We first buy, and then pay for it later, without having a clue if we will be able to earn that money in the future or not. Kinda crazy if you think about it, right? And that's where the problem lies. Once we buy something, the deal is done. Then we have to live with it because we can't change our minds about it later. It's important to realize that the more we give into instant gratification, the more we sink into the pockets of debt and misery. Sooner or later, we're up to our neck and it gets too late to fix things. Sure, spending that $5 right now doesn't seem like a big deal, but do you ever think that the $5 could turn into more than $50 by the time you retire? At where the inflation rate is going at the moment, this certainly could be a reality. The key is simple. Don't keep your money under a mattress. Instead, learn to really invest your money and make it work for you instead. Also, next time when you're making a big purchase, take your time thinking about how your future self will react to it. If possible, write a letter to your future self that you imagine you'll read later. Or write a letter from your future self to be read today like this. Bob, this is you at age 65. I know a new iPhone would be fun, but if you save that money instead, you could buy a cabin in the Poconos. Or lying on the beach or doing whatever it is that happily retired people do. Well, that wraps it up. Were any of these new to you, or were they so cliche that you've heard them a thousand times? In any case, remember they are a cliche for a reason, most probably because they work. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe to Investor Info. Check out our other videos if you like this one. See you next time.